Welcome to ATCM. Uh, today we briefly go through the pediatric cardiac arrest management. So I'll be just running through the uh, PALS algorithms. Uh, what are the guidelines for pediatric cardiac arrest management? So we'll go ahead uh, uh, with the agenda of the talk. First, I will discuss the chain of survival. So what do you exactly mean by chain of survival? You have got two chains of survival. You have got an in-hospital and an out-of-hospital chain of survival. Then uh, uh, we need to discuss regarding the basic life support in a pediatric cardiac arrest. When you have single rescuer or more than one rescuer, what is the algorithm exactly? And we will go through the cardiac arrest algorithm and post cardiac arrest care. So, uh, this is what I will be discussing you for the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Coming to the chain of survival, you are just seeing the chain of survival, the algorithm here. So, uh, you have got the topmost one, what you are able to see is the one for the in-hospital cardiac arrest and the lower down is the pre-hospital cardiac arrest. So when you look at the in-hospital cardiac arrest, first one that what I am pointing here, you are seeing that early recognition and prevention. So what do you exactly mean by early recognition and prevention? Whenever a child is admitted to your hospital, you should have a system in which you should be able to identify a sick child early as possible, as early as possible. So what we use here is a pediatric early warning scoring system. Suppose an oxygen saturation is going below 90 or 95 below. You can make your own values. There should be a system in which you are early recognizing it and the staff nurse or whoever is a junior doctor is identifying this and informing a team of doctors who is going to come to this patient and going to have a quick assessment to the patient and if needed this child will be shifted to a critical care unit for further management. So that is basically you should have a plan for an early recognition and also for prevention of a cardiac arrest. So that is the first chain of survival for the in-hospital cardiac arrest. The second one as you all know it is the activating the emergency response. Whenever you have a cardiac arrest you need to immediately activate the emergency response and the next one, you need to start the high quality CPR. So we have already discussed what exactly mean by high quality CPR. 100 to 120 compression in a minute. One third chest volume of the chest depth of the child should be compressed. And there should not be any interruptions in between. And if at all there is a pulse check, it is not more than 10 seconds for a pulse check in between the uh, compressions. And you should not be using excessive ventilation. That is again one of the key things. You should be avoiding excessive ventilation and you should always allow for an adequate chest recoil. So these are the components of an high quality CPR. Then you need to think about your advanced resuscitation where all your advanced airway, drugs, all those things is going to come. And then you have to do your post cardiac arrest care and later on recovery phase. So that is a chain of survival for the in-hospital cardiac arrest. So in-hospital cardiac arrest, the most important thing, as I said, early recognition prevention, activation of emergency response, high quality CPR, advanced resuscitation, post cardiac arrest care and recovery. So that is the uh, chain of survival for the in-hospital cardiac arrest. Now when we call it as out of hospital or pre-hospital cardiac arrest, the most important thing should be prevention of cardiac arrest. So the prevention, it, it is it's a huge thing. It is not that you should have a child friendly area whenever you're taking child outside for a garden or somewhere else, it should be child friendly area. So the authority, authorities have to make sure that the child is having a safe play area. So these are all the components of a preventive strategies that you can adopt for uh, from a child having a cardiac arrest. For example, the child is going for a booting and uh, you are not giving a jacket for a child, life jacket for a child, for a 10 year old child who is going for a booting with its parents. You are not giving a correct size of a jacket for the child. That is not a preventive thing. You have to do that. So the prevention is the most important thing and activation of emergency response then again comes the high quality cpr then you need to shift to hospital for an advanced resuscitation or inside the ambulance itself you can start an advanced resuscitation followed by post cardiac arrest care and recovery phase so these are the chain of survival for the out of hospital cardiac arrest so uh, just remember when you call when you call, tell it as chain of survival the, it, we have got two components we have got in hospital chain of survival and pre hospital or out of hospital chain of survival for cardiac arrest now let's see, uh, this is a pictorial representation, When uh, what are the methods of doing CPR? There are, we have discussed a lot of methods of doing CPR and which are the common methods of doing a CPR. You can see here what this rescuer is doing, a two finger method. Just see the anterior, the central of the chest. The rescuer has placed two fingers 
and is giving compression at a rate of 100 to 120 compression per minute. So this is how you can do when you have got a single rescuer. So you are alone. So you can use your other hand to fix the head or you can call for help. Use your mobile phone and call for help. And you can start giving compression with the two finger method. So that is called as two finger method. So that is what when you are alone, you can start off with in the center of the chest around 100 to 120 compressions in a minute that you need to do. So that is the first one. Next, we will just see here. This is the thumb encircling method. You see the rescuer has encircled his thumb, encircled his hand and from the center of the chest, he is holding his thumb and giving the compression at the same rate. Whatever we have discussed is the same one third of the chest diameter. You need to compress 100 to 120 compressions in a minute. Everything holds good. But the method only changes. This is the thumb encircling method. And the previous one, what I showed was the two finger method. So that is a method of doing CPR. Now uh, we will go to the next thing that is the algorithm. So uh, we have got two basic algorithms for pediatric advanced life support. So pediatric basic life support algorithm for healthcare providers. It is a single rescuer. You only have one rescuer at present. So what all things needed to be done? We will just run through the algorithm quickly. The first most important thing you have to verify that the scene is safe. So the first important thing that remember that the scene is safe. Before you enter into the scene, make sure that the scene is safe. The next thing as we always discuss, check for response and shout for nearby help and activate the emergency response. We have said in the chain of survival, activating the emergency system via mobile device if appropriate. So whatever is available device in your system in place, you need to activate the emergency response system. The next thing that you need to do head is look for no breathing or only gasping and check pulse simultaneously. You have to check for pulse, look for breathing and check pulse simultaneously and you should not be taking not more than 10 seconds. So infants and all it will be difficult to uh, do a carotid pulse for that reason you can go for brachial pulse. So brachial pulse or femoral pulse or whichever way you can look for uh, the pulse and check for responsiveness again. Uh, when we discussed tapping on the shoulder is what we do for the adult. What you can do in children, just rub it over the heels of the child and see whether the child is responding or not. So look for breathing or only gasping and check for pulse simultaneously. But if you are doing it should not be taking more than 10 seconds. Then you can have three probability. You can have a normal breathing and a pulse is felt. Okay, the child is unresponsive but the patient is having normal breathing and the pulse is felt. Monitor until an emergency responder arrives. So till that time, you can just keep the child under observation. So that is the first thing. And on this extreme right, you can see no normal breathing, but pulse is felt. The child is having a pulse, but no normal breathing. So breathing is under a problem. So what do you have to do? Provide rescue breathing, one breath every two to three seconds. So or about 20 to 30 breaths per minute. So one breath, rescue breaths using a rambo bag every two to three minutes that you need to give on this side. Absence, then again, if the pulse is absent pulse rate for more than 10 seconds, no need to get panic, just start doing your CPR. So that we will anyway discuss in this side. So what we have done, we have two possibilities we have initially discussed. Normal breathing, pulse felt, monitor. Now normal breathing, pulse is felt. Normal breathing is not there, but pulse is felt. Continue with the rescue breaths. And another important thing is that if you feel that pulse rate is less than 60, the child is having a heart rate of less than 60 with signs of poor perfusion. You are seeing motling and the child is drowsy. Anyway, the child is unresponsive, you start CPR. So that is the next thing that you need to do. So if the heart rate is less than 60 with signs of hypoperfusion, you need to start the child on CPR. On the other side, if the child is having less than 60 per minute, but there is no signs of hypoperfusion, just continue the rescue breath. The child is not breathing. That is only issue now. So continue rescue breaths. Uh, every two minutes and you reassess the child after two minutes and see if the pulse is there or not. If no pulse, start CPR. So that is the thing that you need to do if the child is having no normal breathing but pulse is there. Now coming to the center algorithm, here the child is not having a pulse, not having a breathing, not having normal breathing also. So what do you need to do? Just continue CPR. So that is the only thing that you need to do. Then you have, can have two possibilities again here. It is a witness sudden collapse. Suddenly the thing is happened in front of you. Okay. The collapse is happened in front of you. So you it is witness. You straight away run and activate the emergency response if not done initially. Or otherwise it is not a witness collapse. You are seeing a child lying down on the floor. Witness means you are seeing thing happening in front of your eyes. 
food is not witnessed the child is lying down on the floor if you have not activated the emergency response don't run away from the child just start perform cpr and 30 compression and two breaths and when a second rescuer arrives perform a cycle of compression is 15 is to 2 so there are two things it is not much complicated you have to just remember that the child is not breathing no normal breathing no pulse you need to start the child on cpr so how to start cpr is what uh, next important thing but i just one algorithm extra they had it if it is a witnessed one or an unwitnessed one if it is witnessed one you straight away activate the emergency system if not activated if it is on unwitnessed arrest go run to the child start doing compression 30 compression and two breaths so you have to be very clear you have a single rescuer here there is no one here to help you so 30 compression followed by two rescue breaths that you have to give whenever a second rescuer arrives you can make it as 15 is to 2 when it is a single rescuer it is 30 is to 2 and when it is more than one rescuer it is 15 is to 2 and use an AED whenever it is available. You have a defibrillator or an AED, whichever is available, you use it whenever it is available. So that is the next thing. So after about two minutes, okay, you started giving compression at a rate of 100 to 120 compressions in a minute. And after uh, uh, two minutes, you need to reassess the child. You need to reassess the child and see whether uh, the pulse is palpable or the pulse is not there. If there is no pulse, you need to continue the CPR. And meanwhile, you have connected to the AD and check what is the rhythm. If it is a shockable rhythm, like a pulseless ventricular tachycardia or a ventricular fibrillation, that is both are shockable rhythm, you need to deliver the shock. So that we will discuss in the uh, cardiac arrest algorithm. So what you need to remember here is that the patient initially had a sudden collapse, sudden collapse, check for response, shout for nearby help, activate the emergency response. Next thing you have to look for breathing, no normal breathing, no pulse, start CPR, no normal breathing, but pulse is well, give rescue breaths. If both pulse and breathing is okay, you need to just wait and watch till the patient, uh, till the uh, next rescuer comes. Next, if before starting CPR, how to start CPR? I have already mentioned you can have an uh, encircling method, thumb encircling method or two finger method. If it is a one rescue, one rescuer, 30 is to 2. If it is more than one rescuer, it is 15 is to 2. That is the only difference. And once an AED is available and it is connected, check the rhythm, whether it is a shockable rhythm or a non-shockable rhythm. If it is a shockable rhythm, deliver the shock and resume CPR. And if it is a non-shockable rhythm, continue your compression. So only after two minutes, you will be reassessing the child. You will not be reassessing the child in between. So the continuation of this, we will discuss in the uh, pediatric cardiac arrest algorithm so this is the bls algorithm for a single rescuer now we will just see the bls algorithm for more than one rescuer there is nothing changing here only thing is that you straight away start giving compression at a rate of 15 is to 2 if you have more than one rescuer that is only thing that is major difference there is nothing major difference you can just see first rescuer perform cycles of 30 compression and two breaths when second rescuer returns perform cycles of 15 is to 2 that is the only difference so straight away when you have more than two rescuer you can start with 15 is to 2 when you are only one rescuer you start with 30 is to 2 so that is the only difference in the pediatric algorithm that you need to remember or bls algorithm that you need to remember so we have what we have done we have a child who has become unresponsive and the child had no normal breathing no pulse we are started giving compression. We are giving compression at a rate of 100 to 120 compression per minute. One third of the depth of the chest circumference we need to compress and we need to minimize interruptions, avoid excessive ventilations and we need to allow for adequate chest recoil also so that the venous return will occur. So these are the components of high quality CPR. Now we will just see the pediatric cardiac arrest algorithm. So again what we have done is that we have started the CPR. We are just continuing from the BLS algorithm. We are continuing the CPR, we are continuing the back mass ventilation. Uh, after every 15 breaths, we are giving two rescue breaths. So 15 is to two, like that up till two minutes, you need to continue and see how the child is responding or not. The sooner an AED or a defibrillator is available, you need to connect to the AED and see whether it is a shockable rhythm or it's a non-shockable rhythm. So that is the next thing. So what if it is a shockable rhythm? So what do you have to do? What if it is a non-shockable rhythm, what do you have to do? So first see, we will see it's a shockable rhythm. So as I told, there is two things that is a shockable rhythm, what we call is a ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. 
So if it is a pulseless ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, the first thing that you need to do once you start doing CPR, just stop the CPR and you connect it to the monitor and see that it is a shockable rhythm. You have to deliver the first shock. You have to defibrillate the child. Now, how much energy that you need to defibrillate? You start with 2 joules per kg. If the child is having 10 joules, so 10 kg, you have to start with 20 kg, 20 joules. So, 2 joules per kg is the body is the dosing that is initially needed for your defibrillation. Subsequent second shock, you need to increase it 4 joules per kg. And like that, you can start increasing till a maximum joules of 10 joules per kg or the maximum that of the adult dose that is 200 joules. So that is what you need to do if you have a biphasic defibrillator, if we are having a shockable rhythm, you, you first shock you deliver at 2 joules per kg, subsequent shock you increase to 4 joules per kg, to or maximum of 10 joules per kg or maximum that of the adult dose that is 200 joules in a biphasic defibrillator. Now what you have done, you have delivered the first shock, soon after the first shock initiate your CPR, you continue your CPR and look for an IV or an IU access. If you are failing for an IV access, two attempts you have failed, go for an IU access. And after two minutes of CPR, again you reassess the rhythm. If it is shockable, again you need to do defibrillation, but this time you need to double the dose for your done. If you have given two joules initially, you have to make it four joules. And then only the dose, we have to give the first dose of epinephrine. So remember that only after the second shock, we are delivering epinephrine in a case of a shockable rhythm in a pediatric cardiac arrest and also you need to consider an advanced airway. Now the important thing what is the dose of epinephrine? Epinephrine dose is very clear you can see the chart here 0.01 milligram per kg body weight that is the dose of epinephrine that you need to remember 0.01 milligram per kg of epinephrine or you need diluted 0.1 ml per kg of the 0.1 mg per ml concentration. So just remember 0.01 milligram per kg of epinephrine the first dose you can deliver after the second shock if it is a shockable to them. Then you similarly you continue uh, again after uh, two minutes of CPR you reassess the child if the rhythm is still shockable you deliver the shock and then comes the role of amiodarone or lidocaine. So what, what you can do after the second shock you can tell the nurse to prepare amiodarone or lidocaine because Possibly this child may need an amiodarone because after third shock the rhythm is not reverted. You need to give amiodarone and lidocaine. And again, dose of amiodarone, you can see the chart here. It is 5 milligram per kilogram body weight during cardiac arrest. Three doses we can repeat to a maximum dose, or lidocaine, if you are using it is 1 milligram per kilogram body weight. So that is your shockable rhythm algorithm. So till you are achieving an ROSC or uh, you are not getting an uh, ROSC, you can think of stopping the CPR. But till you are getting ROSC, you need to continue the cycle in the part of a shockable rhythm. So now coming to the next side, that is the asystole or PA or otherwise we can call it as non-shockable rhythms. PA and asystole, we, we are not supposed to do defibrillation. What you have to do as soon as you start CPR, you need to give epinephrine as early as possible. You can give 0.01 milligram of epinephrine. Remember, in the side of shockable rhythm, only after two shocks we deliver epinephrine. But in case of PEA bar asystole, soon after you recognize that it is an asystole bar PEA, you need to deliver the first dose of epinephrine. If epinephrine is given, you need to repeat it every three to five minutes. And also you can continue for advanced airway. And if you have got an ETCO2, well and good. Uh, but if you don't have an ETCO2, okay, that's fine. But you need to continue your compression at 15 is to 2. And every 3 to 5 minutes, you need to repeat epinephrine. Then again, you after 2 minutes, you have to see whether the rhythm is shockable. If the rhythm is shockable, you straight away go to the, on the other side of the algorithm, you need to defibrillate. If rhythm is non shockable, you need to continue this process. So that is what you need to do for a shockable and a non shockable rhythm. So just go through this algorithm. On this side, there are few boxes. I'll just read through that. CPR quality, I have already said, push hard and push fast. More than one third the AP diameter of the chest needed to be compressed. 100 to 120 compression in a minute. Minimize interruptions. Change compression every two minutes or sooner if fatigued. If no advanced airway, you don't have intubated the child, continue at 15 is to 2. Or if you have an advanced airway, that is, you have intubated the child, if you have got an advanced airway, you give a breath every 2 to 3 seconds. No need to synchronize with the compression. You just need to continue a breath every 2 to 3 seconds. 
एनर्जीज ऑफ शॉक वी ऑलरेडी डिस्कस फर्स्ट शॉक टू जूल्स पर के जी सेकेंड फोर जूल्स पर के जी सब्सिक्वेंट मोर देन फोर जूल्स पर के जी और मैक्सिम ऑफ टेन जूल्स पर के जी और दैट ऑफ दी अडल्ट डोज ड्रग थेरापी एपिनेफ्रिन आई ऑलरेडी डिस्कस अमेडरॉन एंड लिडोकिन वी ऑलरेडी सेट थ्रू एडवांस एयरवे एंडोट्रिकल इंटिबेशन और सुपराग्लोटिक एडवांस एयरवे कैन बी ट्राइड वे फॉर्म कैप्टोनोग्राफी और कैप्टोग्राम टू कन्फर्म द मॉनिटर एंड ईटी टू प्लेसमेंट सो वी आर इंडिबेटिंग दिस साइड टू कन्फर्म द पोजिशन ऑफ ईटी टू यू कैन यूज इन अडल्ट वी ऑल्सो यूज ईटी सीओ टू टू रिकग्नाइज द क्वालिटी ऑफ सी पी आर बट इन एलगोरिजम दे आर नॉट मैंशनिंग इयर द यूज ऑफ ईटी सीओ टू फॉर मैंशनिंग द क्वालिटी ऑफ सी पी आर देन लुक्स फॉर द एच एस एंड टी यू नीड टू ऑलवेज लुकिंग फॉर द कार्डियक कॉसेस सो इन चाइल्ड इट इज हाइपोलिमिया हाइपोक्सिया हाइड्रोजन आयन दैट इज असिडोसिस hypoglycemia that is one difference that is from the adult algorithm you don't have hypoglycemia in adult cardiac arrest for hsnts but it is there in pediatric hypoglycemia hypo or hyperkalemia hypothermia then you need to look in for tension pneumothorax tamponade cardiac tamponade toxins thrombosis coronary as well as pulmonary thrombosis so this is the pediatric cardiac arrest algorithm so what has happened we have starting resuscitating the child we are looking for any return of spontaneous circulation if there is return of spontaneous circulation what we need to do is go for the post cardiac arrest care so the child has got a pulse palpable pulse you have stopped the cpr what are the things that you need to do for a post cardiac arrest care so these are the component oxygenation and ventilation what are the major things that you need to do measure oxygenation and target normoxemia of around 94 to 99 percentage so that is what is important not 100 94 to 99 percentage between you need to maintain the saturation measure and target a pacio2 appropriate to the patient's underlying condition and limit exposure to severe hypercapnia or hypocapnia so what do you need to maintain is a normocapnia normal pco2 level so that is regarding your oxygenation and ventilation now coming to the hemodynamic monitoring set specific hemodynamic goal during post cardiac arrest and care and review it daily monitor with cardiac telemetry if available arterial blood pressure if possible you place an arterial line and monitor the arterial blood pressure serum lactate urine output cvp saturation central venous oxygen saturation will help to guide your therapies and use parenteral fluid bolus with or with adenotropes or vasopressor to maintain a systolic blood pressure greater than the fifth percentage for the age and sex that is important we can't set a value here because for child as the age advances the value changes what do you need to remember greater than the fifth percentile for the age and sex so, so that is what is you have to maintain in a child now ttm that is again most important targeted temperature management measure and continuously monitor the core temperature prevent and treat fever immediately after cardiac arrest do your rewarming and if patient is comatose that is after the cpr after the return of spontaneous circulation the patient is not conscious and not getting awake up start the temperature targeted temperature management 32 to 34 degrees celsius followed by 36 to 36 7.5 degrees celsius or you can maintain normothermia that is 36 degrees celsius to 37.5 degrees celsius so that is what is you have to do for the next 24 hours prevent shivering and monitor blood pressure and treat hypotension during rewarming there is a possibility of hypotension you need to do that neuro monitoring what we have to do if patient has encephalopathy and resources are available monitor with continuous eeg if you have available well and good treat seizures avoid hypoxia that is again very important seizures will cause again hypoxia so seizures need to be treated consider early imaging to diagnose the treatable cause if you are finding any treatable cause of cardiac arrest early imaging may be warranted electrolyte measure blood glucose and avoid hypoglycemia you need to avoid that maintain electrolyte with normal range to avoid possible life threatening arrhythmias because potassium calcium magnesium phosphorus you need to keep a target for that sedation treat with sedatives and anxiolytics you need to use that prognosis how need you prognosticate the child always consider multiple modalities clinical and other over any single predictive factor so you need to have a clinical predictive eeg imaging with all this help you can predict the outcome of the child remember that assessment may be modified by ttm or induced by hypothermia so you are doing hypothermia you might not be able to say anything maybe after 48 to 78 2 hours only you will be able to clearly predict consider eeg in conjunction with other factor within first 7 days so eeg possible within first day 7 days of cardiac arrest continuous consider neuroimaging such as mri during the first 7 days not immediate mri maybe after 48 to 72 hours you can think of but within 7 days you have to consider 
MRI if needed if the patient is not improving. So these are the components of the post cardiac arrest care. Now let us see there are some top 10 take home messages this is again from the PALS algorithm whatever I am saying here. So uh, what we have discussed is regarding our uh, pediatric BLS and pediatric cardiac arrest management. So let us see the point number one high quality cardiopulmonary resuscitation is the foundation of the resuscitation we have already discussed. New data reform that the key components of high quality CPR providing adequate chest compression rate and depth with minimizing interruptions in CPR allowing full re chest recoil between compression and avoiding excessive ventilation that is what is called as high quality CPR always remember this high quality CPR a respiratory rate of 20 to 30 breaths per minute is, is, is new for infants and children who are receiving CPR with an advanced airway in place or receiving rescuing breath having a pulse. So previously uh, it was not now in the newer updation they have made it 20 to 30 breaths. For patient with non shockable rhythm the early epinephrine is administered after CPR at initiation the more likely the patient is to survive that is what we discussed in the algorithm in the shockable non shockable cardiac arrest as soon as possible you administer epinephrine use a cuff endotracheal tube decrease the need of endotracheal tube changes so whenever possible use a cuffed endotracheal tube the routine use of cricoid pressure that is again we have to give a compression cricoid pressure to avoid regurgitation cricoid pressure does not reduce risk of regurgitation that is what they have found if you are using cricoid pressure that is of no use again during mask bag ventilation and may impede intubation it will become difficult for you to intubate so routine cricoid pressure is not needed as per the new algorithm for out of hospital cardiac arrest back mask ventilation result in same resuscitation outcome so that's what say intubation is not the important thing and high quality cpr is more than enough so if you are not able to intubate also that is fine just continue your back mask ventilation so learn how to do a good back mask ventilation if you doesn't know resuscitation does not end with return of spontaneous circulation very key excellent post cardiac arrest care is clinical critically important to achieving the best patient outcomes for children who do not regain consciousness after ROSC, this care includes TTM and continuous EG monitoring. The prevention and treatment of hypotension, hypoxia, hyproxia and hypercapnia and hypocapnia and I will add one more hypoglycemia is very very important. So this H you have to remember hypotension, hyproxia, hypoxia, hypercapnia, hypocapnia and hypoglycemia you need to avoid. And finally after discharge from hospital. Cardiac arrest survivor can have physical, cognitive and emotional challenges and may need ongoing therapies and interventions very important. Naloxone again an antidote for opioid toxicity can reverse respiratory arrest due to opioid overdose, but there is no evidence that it benefits the patient in cardiac arrest. So blindly giving naloxone is not recommended. Fluid resuscitation in sepsis is based on patient response and require frequent reassessment like balanced crystalloid, unbalanced crystalloid and colloids are all acceptable for sepsis resuscitation. Epinephrine or non-epinephrine infusion are used for fluid refractory septic shock. So what we have discussed in a nutshell is the pediatric cardiac uh, arrest management. We have gone through the chain of survival initially. Then we gone into the pediatric BLS. We have discussed how to give compression, one rescuer, single rescuer, how to be the differentiation, when to use your defibrillator, shockable rhythm, non-shockable rhythm, what are the drugs to be used. Once the ROC is, it is, is achieved, what needed to be done, what is the post cardiac arrest care that you need to follow and we have looked for the reversible causes of cardiac arrest. I hope it is clear. Thank you for your listening. Thank you.